no apology for that uh, because prayer is absolutely essential to the life of the believer. Any disciple of Jesus Christ will only grow more like Jesus through a, a vibrant life of prayer. If you don't pray, you should expect to struggle. If, if you don't consistently and regularly crucify your flesh on the altar of daily prayer, don't be surprised that you struggle. Uh, don't be surprised that depression and fear and anxiety and all of that holds on if, if, if you're refusing to take that effort of prayer. Uh, but if, if you, uh, and this, this is, I've heard uh, a man of God whose, whose life I respect greatly make this statement. He said, uh, if you will fight the battle for daily prayer, you will be spared from hundreds of other battles that you'll otherwise have to fight. If you can learn to crucify your flesh, uh, you can begin to walk in victory. And so this morning, I want to teach on the privilege of prayer. As prayer often is treated as a duty, and it is indeed a duty. Uh, but we have to remember, it, it will keep your life far sweeter to remember that prayer is also an incredible privilege. Psalm chapter 65 and verse 4 says this, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest, and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. In prayer, God will choose those who consistently reach for him, and he will cause them to approach unto him so that you can dwell in the courts of God. Would you pause for a second and think about how wonderful that is? You, as, as David writes in, let's, let's read Psalm chapter 8 and verse 3. When I consider the heavens and the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him. Who are you that God would even pay attention to you? I don't know if that hurts your feelings or bursts your bubble this morning, but who, who are you that the God that created this universe would focus on you? He said, you have made him a little lower than the angels, but you've crowned him with glory and honor, and you made him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. You see, it's a privilege for us to approach unto God in prayer. The God who created all of the universe desires greatly desires to hear your voice in prayer. Psalm chapter 27 and verse 7 reads this. In the New Living Translation, it says, Hear me as I pray, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. Isn't that what we all want? We want to know that God has heard us. We want him to be merciful. We want him to answer us. But look at verse 8. It says this, My heart has heard you say, Come and talk with me. That's God speaking to you. And God is saying to every single man, woman, and child under the sound of my voice this morning, Come and talk with me. And my heart responds, I'm busy. My heart responds, uh, sorry, I got something else going on. My heart responds with, well, just a moment, I, I don't have a whole lot of time. No, the psalmist says, my heart responds with, Lord, I am coming. I'm coming into your presence. You've got to understand it is absolutely the desire of God for you to come and to talk with him. I want to read today, we're going to read pretty extensively from the Song of Solomon. And uh, this is, of course, a love song that is written 
On its, on its first layer, it is a, a love song between a husband and a bride. But as you, you dive deeper into it, we understand that this portion of Scripture was inspired by God for a reason. There is, there is another level to it or another layer to it. And you, you begin to understand that this is not just between Solomon and a young woman. This is between Christ and his church. It's a love song between a bride and a groom. And so Song of Solomon chapter 1 and verse 4. The bride says this. Draw me. We will run after thee. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in thee. We will remember thy love more than wine. The upright Love thee. This is the voice of a bride. And men in this place right now, don't be too uncomfortable about it. You are a part of the bride of Christ. All right? So get over it. You're a part of the bride of Christ. Ladies, you are all adopted as sons of God. All right? And so eventually when we get to heaven, there will be neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, but we'll all be one with Jesus Christ, okay? And so for a moment, men, you need to just go ahead and understand and accept the fact that you are the bride of Christ. And so the king is drawing her to himself. He's bringing her into his chambers, into a secret place, into a place of intimacy. What is this? This is an invitation to prayer. This is an invitation to come beyond outer courts, beyond an arm's length relationship, beyond just a casual Sunday attendance, into a daily place where you're in the chambers of the king. We move to Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 8. And now this is, this is again the voice of the bride. And I want you to hear the sound. Anybody remember young love? It's awkwardly quiet in this place. Okay, let me ask it this way. Is anybody in love? Every, every married person right now, for the sake of your marriage, please shout yes. All right. Okay. Just checking. But you, re, you remember, I remember it was middle school. <laughs> My bride is not here right now. She's teaching Sunday school downstairs. And so uh, that, that was puppy love. And I remember... Moments throughout our teenage years, and you you got to forgive me. I've been married since I was 18, and so uh, I never really got to experience what it was like to be like 30 and dating, nor do I want to. That's a horrific scene. Uh, I'm thankful that I got that out of my way in my teens, uh, and God has been good to me. We've been married 17 years, uh, still married to the same person. I thank God for that. I'm approaching the halfway point of my life. I'm 36 now. I've been married uh, since I was 18, and so I'm, I'm like there. I'm crossing the halfway point of my life. I don't have a clue how to interact with anybody uh, in, in any sort of romantic way other than Stacey Chemis, I, and I'm happy about it. I, I've learned so far... Uh, we're, we're taking a sidebar since it got so awkwardly quiet when I gave the married people a chance to say something. I've learned... So far that if you'll do it right and you'll put effort into it, marriage doesn't become colder and more calloused. It truly becomes the sweetest thing that you could ever hope for other than a relationship with Jesus Christ. I love my, I, I, I don't say this, she's not even here, I'm not even getting brownie points. I don't know if she'll listen later or not, I hope she does. I love my wife now more than I did the day that I got married. That is God's desire for you walking with him. Not to look back fondly on the day that you were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost as the great, it is the greatest thing that's ever happened to you, by the way. But every day with Jesus becomes sweeter than the day before. 
And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then this sermon is for you. Because that is the desire of God that you would be married to him and draw closer to him in love every single day of your life. I'm telling you, I I open the screen of my phone and it's a picture of my wife with a ginormous smile on her face. And it does something to my heart. We're just going to be we're going to be gushy and emotional in here, okay? And every married person in the house, listen, I hope when your spouse walks in, it does something to your heart. There should be a desire inside of you not to get away, not to go on separate vacations. God help us. I, I don't have a clue what separate vacations are about, okay? 24 hours in, I'm like, okay, I, where's my wife? I need, I, need to, I need to be with my spouse. I need to be with her. So with that in mind, I'll use myself as an example, and you can all think I'm crazy. I don't really care. With that in mind, let's go to Song of Solomon chapter 2 and verse 8. Now listen, this is the bride. This is her speaking about the groom. And I want you to question for a moment, do you feel this way about your groom? Do you feel this way about Jesus Christ? She says this, The voice of my beloved... Behold, he cometh leaping upon the mountains, skipping upon the hills. What's going on? He's so delighted to be coming down to where his bride is. He's leaping upon the mountains and skipping upon the hills. He doesn't care if it's dignified. He doesn't care what anybody else thinks. That is love. And that's the picture God allowed to be drawn of himself approaching his bride. He's literally skipping down the mountains with joy because he's coming to see his bride. Everybody say, that's me. He's skipping down mountains, and she's hearing his voice, and she says, ah, the voice of my beloved. Uh, And she says in verse 9, my beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the window, showing himself through the lattice. What's going on? Okay, so there's houses in the Middle East, and the houses, almost all of them have a wall around them. So he has skipped down the mountains to her home, and he's standing outside the home uh, behind the wall, and there's a lattice that's built over the windows. What is the, what is the groom doing? He's looking on his tiptoes over the walls. Uh, he's looking forth at the windows. Uh, he's allowing her to catch glimpses of him through the lattice, uh, and all he's trying to do is see his bride uh, in the window. He's just trying to catch a glimpse of his bride that's how bad he wants to see her everybody say that's me look at the picture of your God drawing you to prayer skipping down the mountains how dignified of the creator of the universe but he's that excited to talk to you and there he is trying to get a glimpse of you through the windows and finally he speaks and this is what he says in verse 10 my beloved spake and said unto me rise up my love my fair one and come away that's his desire is that you would release yourself from the distractions of your day you would release yourself from the busyness of your life uh, and in love, uh, not out of mere duty, uh, not always out of just discipline, but out of love, uh, you would come away to a secret place with him uh, so that you too can talk together. He says this in verse 14, watch this. Man, if you could get a revelation of how desperately your father loves you, how desperately he is in love with his bride, it would change your prayer life completely. Look at verse 14. He says this, O my dove, thou that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy countenance. Voice. God's prayer request to you is this uh, I want to see your face. I want to hear your voice. Uh, He's asking the bride, uh, Let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. Why? For sweet is thy voice, and thy countenance is 
comely. Again, everybody in this place, you're a part of the bride of Christ. Uh, and your father just told you uh, your face is beautiful uh, and your voice is sweet. I want to see your face and I want to hear your voice. That doesn't just sound like duty. That doesn't just sound like you're only a soldier. That sounds like a sweet relationship that the groom uh, wants to draw the bride into. Uh, Come, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. In chapter 3, again with the bride, we read in verse 1, By night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. Any married person, well maybe not any married person, uh, separate Bedrooms are a thing these days for sleeping. Uh, I can only talk about myself, so back to myself. Y'all, you, you do whatever you want. I don't sleep right when my wife isn't there. It, it just, it feels weird. There's supposed to be somebody here on my left side. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not right when she's not there. Now, part of the problem is we have a sleep number bed, and so you can't just, like, move over to the middle because then you got two different air chambers, and it's like you're on the waves all night long. But when, when my bride isn't there, something ain't right. And so here she is by night on her bed. She seeks him who her soul loveth, but he's not there. And so she says, I will rise now and go about in the city streets, and in the broadways will I seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. And the watchmen of the city that go about, they found her, and they said, Who are you looking for? And she said, Have you seen the one that my soul loveth? You see, when, when you go to prayer, and it feels like God isn't there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I can't be the only one. When, when you go to prayer and it feels like God is absent from you, that's not a sign to you to just be like, all right, well, I guess today's just one of those days. Everybody doing all right? Poke your neighbor. Tell him to wake up. It's not a sign just to back off and be like, well, I guess God doesn't want to talk to me today. She arises from her bed in the night and begins to search the city looking for the presence of her groom. She said, I looked for him, but I found him not. She was searching everywhere, high and low. She was looking up and down. She was trying to find the presence of her love. And she's asking even the watchmen of the city. And verse 4 says this, it was but a little while that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loveth. Uh, and uh, in those moments, all of the sudden in a prayer meeting, you might be 30 minutes in uh, and you're looking for God and you're feeling for him and you're trying to find him. Uh, but if you'll stay in it uh, and you'll keep pressing and you'll keep looking and you'll keep searching uh, and you'll keep praying, uh, it's just a little while and all of the sudden uh, you're going to find the one that your soul loves. Uh, you will come in contact with him. Uh, he's not praying hard to get. Uh, he's just seeing if there's actually a hunger in your heart, uh, a desire inside of you uh, to find him. Uh, and you will find him if you'll press just a little bit longer. Uh, you'll find the one that your soul loves. Uh, and look at what she does. Uh, I held him and I would not let him go. When you find Jesus in prayer, that's not the signal to be done. The signal to be done is not the moment where you can feel a reassuring touch of the Spirit and a little tear down your cheek so you know that Jesus still loves you. That's the beginning of prayer. That's the place where now you've got a hold of him. And so just like the bride, you got to wrap your arms around him. you got to hold on and you 
cannot let go. Hold to the one whom your soul loves. Would you lift your hands in this place right now? Would you ask God to give us a hunger and a desire for him in prayer? Hallelujah. 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 I want to encourage somebody right now. It is just a, a little while. It is but a little while. And you will find the one whom your soul loveth. And when you do, you hold to him and you do not let him go. But Song of Solomon chapter 5 records something different. Whereas in chapter 3, she realizes hey, he, he's not here and i got to find him. Chapter 5 tells a little bit of a different story. It says, I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. For my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of night. Wouldn't you know it? Prayer doesn't always come at the most convenient time. In fact, I think God kind of resents when we schedule him from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. And then he has no place in our calendar for the rest of the day. My goodness. And so here she is asleep. And a voice comes from outside the door saying, open to me, my love. My head is filled with dew and my locks with the drop. He's out in the wet, the dew environment, and he's calling to his bride, hey, let me in. And instead of chapter 3 where she says, I will rise now. And go about in the city, in the streets. She says this. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? You see. We, we've got to move past a place where we brush our teeth at night. And lay down in bed and realize. You know I haven't prayed today. And then out of guilt we just we mumble for five minutes. And then we pass out. I'll be, I'll be completely transparent with you. I have, well, I've not forgotten to pray. But I, I've been to that place where I'm like, ah, I just don't, I don't feel like he's here right now. And so we just mumble a few things and go through the motions. But God is drawing us and inviting us to a place where even if it's inconvenient, my head hits the pillow and I hear the voice of my beloved bounding and skipping down the mountains. Now, he's not a jerk. He wants you to sleep. He understands your physical limitations better than you do. He created you. And then he incarnated himself in flesh and experienced all of your physical weaknesses. He's not a total jerk. He, he's not going to make you go without sleep. But there will be moments where he calls and says, hey, would you open to me? Would you let me in? And she says, my coat is already off. I'm already in my pajamas, Lord. I've already brushed my teeth. For her, it was washing feet. Maybe you take a foot bath before bed. I don't know. I've already brushed my teeth, God. How, how, how can I get up now? I've already put my phone on do not disturb. That's a great thing, by the way. That's, that's like the call to prayer itself right there. When this distraction is finally removed, whoo, glory. And so she says, how can I defile my feet? What is she doing? She's making excuses about why it's inconvenient to be with her beloved. But God, as any passionate married person knows, was not so easily put off by a simple excuse. It says, my beloved put his hand by the hole of the door. He began to move the doorknob. 
He's like, hey, is this, is this thing locked? Like, will you let me in? And she says, now my bowels were moved for him. There was that feeling, that butterfly feeling that we all equate with love. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Every married person in this place, just give me one of these. Okay. I'm giving you free brownie points today, okay? This, this is easy. And so now her bowels begin to move, and she's like, okay, you know what? I, I'm for this. She rises up and opens to the beloved. My hands dropped with myrrh and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. I opened unto my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. You can only tell somebody you love, stay away for so long before they're going to remove your, themselves from your presence. You can only tell somebody this is not a convenient time, this is not a good time for so long before they stop asking for your time. You can only tell your spouse so many times, I'm too busy for you right now, before they take the hint and they remove themselves from you. If there is never a fight in your marriage, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything's going well. It might just be that you've learned to live separate lives apart from each other and never come together like a married couple. But here she is finally responding, but she waited too long in the moment moment uh, and the beloved had left I am average in so many areas of my life I'm an average person average height average build average looks I once made it to week seven of a nine-week basic training and one day at mail call the drill sergeant stopped and he looked at me and I can't fully repeat what he said, but in essence, he asked me, who are you? I'm like, I've been here for seven weeks with you. I have this incredible ability to disappear into a crowd. Average finances, average intelligence, probably below average athletic ability. But there's one area of my life that I refuse to be average. It's an area that I have control over. And that area is my pursuit of my beloved. Oh, uh, I can see him uh, skipping down the mountains. Uh, throughout my day, I can hear the voice of my beloved calling to me. Uh, he's asking me, rise up, come away with me, be with me. Uh, you've got to get something down inside of you that refuses to be average, uh, refuses to be ordinary, refuses to be lackadaisical or laid back about your relationship with God. Uh, don't you understand that prayer uh, is an incredible privilege? Don't you understand uh, it's more than a duty? Uh, it's a deep relationship with him. Uh, it's a calling uh, to a secret place with the Most High. Uh, it's a calling to come away uh, into a period of intimacy with him uh, where he tells you his heart and you share with him yours. Uh, why would we be satisfied with average or ordinary in a pursuit of God in prayer. In Luke chapter 16 and verse 16, Jesus said the law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presseth into it. That verse does not mean that 100% of people are pressing into the kingdom of God. Or our city, our country, and this very room would be completely different. What that means is that anybody that's getting into the kingdom of God is doing so because they're pressing into it. What is pressing? It means that you've got your shoulder in. Uh, it means you're pushing. Uh, it means you're trying to shove your way past any obstacle, any barrier, anything that would keep you from the presence of God. Uh, if you're going to have a, a dynamic life of prayer, it cannot be in convenient moments. It cannot be uh, just from 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. And would to God everybody in this room prayed an hour every morning. Uh, 
our city would be transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, but a life of prayer with him is going to require you to move past calendar and clock and convenience. Uh, but when you've pressed into the presence of God, uh, oh, how sweet it is. Uh, oh, how wonderful it is to be caught away with the Lord. Uh, all time drifts away. Uh, every other concern melts into the background. Uh, and it can be just you and your beloved. I remember moments. In fact, I witnessed it just this last week. One of the attendees that was with us once we finally were on our way back. She missed her beloved. You know, they're 20 and 23 years old, and so it's pretty young love. And for like three hours in the airport, I mean, they only paused to go through customs. But for three hours in the airport, they're on FaceTime together. You've run out of things to talk about after three hours. But they wanted to see each other's face. And they just wanted to know that they were there. My God. Think about it for a moment. That's exactly how God feels about you. You don't even have to say anything. He just wants to know that you're there. He just wants to know that your voice uh, can ring out to him. He just wants to know that you're close. Uh, oh, I pray that every single one of us would have that hunger for prayer, uh, that desire to be with him. Uh, you don't even have to say anything. Uh, you can just sit there with him and be there. It's just enough to be with him. Oh, there'll be moments in prayer, I promise you, if you'll get lost in the time. Uh, there'll be moments in prayer where you are shouting to the heavens. Uh, there'll be moments in prayer where he's shouting back to you. Uh, but then there'll be those tender moments uh, where it's just enough to know uh, he's there. Uh, he's there. Uh, he's with me and I'm with him. Uh, oh, how sweet it is to be in love uh, with the Savior. How sweet it is to walk uh, with him, to talk with him, to hear his voice every moment of my day. It's a privilege to pray. Uh, it's a privilege to come into his presence. Uh, it's a privilege to be with him. It's a privilege to get lost with him, uh, to be alone with Jesus. It was in prayer in my life. This is not theory. I, I have not mastered prayer. Please understand me. I, I don't stand up here as somebody that has mastered prayer. God is still working on me, but I'm so thankful that he's still drawing me. And it was about 10 years ago in my life I made a decision. I, re, I refuse. Uh, I refuse to be average in my pursuit of God. It's the one thing that's in my control. Uh, I can't control where I was born. I can't control who my parents were. Uh, I can only listen to the voice of God as he leads me, but I can't and control my level of hunger and pursuit of him. It was in prayer that a spirit of lust in my life was broken. It was in prayer that insecurity was revealed. But it was also in prayer that insecurities were healed. It was in prayer that envy and resentment were revealed in my life. I can take you to the very place. I've never heard the audible voice of God through my ears, but I have heard, I, I don't even know if I can say that, that that's true anymore. I, I, I've heard him speak so clearly that I've stood up from where I was praying to check if anybody else was in the room. I can take you to the place where I was praying on an extended fast, and God told me about envy and resentment in my heart that I wasn't even aware of. But I can also take you to the place in prayer where God healed the envy and resentment in my heart that I wasn't even aware of. I can take you to the place, the very place where I was crying out to God. I didn't even realize my great desperation and need for affirmation. And I can take you to the place where God spoke, you are my beloved son, and I am well pleased. 
You see, prayer is a great privilege. It's a great privilege. It's more than a duty. It's a blessing. And if you'll press into prayer, if you'll respond to your beloved, oh, there's a great privilege. What's going to happen? He's going to counsel you. He's going to heal you. He's going to work on you. He's going to saw off uh, what doesn't need. There's going to be a pruning process every now and again, but more fruit is going to be produced. Uh, He's going to sand off the rough edges. He's going to do incredible things in your life. That's all if you'll pray. It's an incredible privilege. What is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visitest him? Miguel, what are we? That the God of the universe would be so passionately in love with us. Let's stand to our feet right now. I feel a sweet call to somebody in this place right now. I wish everybody would respond affirmatively. I wish everybody would would make a commitment right now to change out of a prayer habit into a prayer life. Don't let it just be a habit. Don't let it just be something that you schedule. Make it who you are. Make it what you do. Make it the very core and the foundation of your life. Would you lift your hands? If you're hungry for this, would you lift your hands right now? And would you ask him to move in your heart? You don't have to understand everything because you can grow and you can become more like him. But if you're hungry for a deeper relationship with Jesus, would you lift your hands and would you ask him right now? uh, By the power and the authority of the Holy Ghost, Lord, I pray that his spirit